Hello, I'm Bob Newport and welcome to the first in my series of videos on glass. We're going to look at aspects of science and through into engineering, technology and art. So lots and lots of pretty images to look at on the way. Um, behind me you'll see on my green screen image there's a piece of glass art by a local artist, Grace Ason, and I'll show you some more details of this uh, a couple of slides into our video. So here we go. So as you can see on our title slide here we've got um, an example of a bit of glass art. Uh, it's a peculiar one in the sense that the clear glass you can see in this image uh, has been made to mimic the shape of a crystal of quartz uh, and that has a particular significance in what we're going to talk about and I'll come to that uh, in just a little while. Uh, the details for this image, uh, its source where you can take a look at it, uh, are at the bottom of the screen in italics and for the images that I've um, used throughout uh, this um, set of slides you should find source information on the slides or um, in the blog post that goes with this. So let's plow on, let's take a look inside glass. Well this is who I am. Um, the blog post that I mentioned that has all the details of this video and the other ones that I've made for my local branch of the University of the Third Age here in Canterbury uh, is at the top of the screen. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well and of course on YouTube, uh, but that goes without saying. If you're watching this you've already discovered that. Uh, the information associated with um, um, Grace Ason's work that I'm going to use as my green screen backdrops in this series is shown at the bottom there. Uh, apologies, there is a missing bracket, uh, you'll have to forgive me for that. But her um, her website for these images in, in her light boxes series is shown down there in italics. The particular image that I'm using for this video uh, is called Construction One. Well, where are we going to go? Um, basically, I'm going to pose a lot of questions for us, uh, implicitly if not explicitly. We need to think about what a glass is first uh, and we're going to do this at the level of its arrangement of atoms. In fact, that's probably the clearest way to define what a glass is. Uh, and then of course how it's made. And there are lots of different ways that glass can be made, both uh, industrially of course, uh, but also in nature and we'll take a little look uh, at some examples of that as well. Um, glass technology is, is all over the place, uh, everything from window panes through to fibre optic cables. So we really need to have a little bit of a tour through the technological uses of, of glass as well and how that's developed uh, through history. And then what we can do to modify the properties of our glass. Uh, and that of course becomes very important when we start looking at um, uh, the use of glass in art for instance where we want to add colour uh, but of course it's also important when we come to other specialised uses of glass and, and again we'll cover that in, in more or less detail as we go through. Uh, and then I want to take a peek uh, into not necessarily the future, but certainly the cutting edge of where we are with glass now. Uh, so we're going to discover in the final video in the series um, the role that glass had, for instance, uh, in the discovery of gravity waves um, just about a year or so ago. Uh, its use, for instance, in regrowing uh, bone in people um, so it's bioactive uses, in other words. There's all sorts of things that we can cover uh, in that section and, and I'm not going to ignore it, but we won't get to that until the end of the series. Uh, 
So we're going to be looking at the science of glass, of course. That's my particular background, so that's a natural way for me to approach it. But also, as I said right at the beginning, we need to um, also follow th that through into engineering, into technology, uh, and um, into art. Why not? So specifically, uh, the topics that we're going to cover are here. Uh, we're going to look at, as I said, all of these different aspects of glass. Glass really is a material with a lot of richness to it. Um, and um, towards the end, I'm also going to take a little look at some of the myths associated with glass. And there are quite a lot of those as well. In this first video in the series, and in fact this will bleed through into video two as well, I want to focus on what a glass is um, and how we make it. So let's have a look. I think the best place to start uh, in terms of um, defining what a glass is, is to rule out what it isn't. Uh, if we look at the coverage of materials in most school textbooks and in fact most university textbooks uh, it tends to focus on uh, the properties of crystals certainly if you're doing a physics or a chemistry course that will be uh, that will be the case because they're easy to describe and particularly easy to describe mathematically and there's a reason for that but what we get with a crystal is a regular shape. So you can perhaps think of table salt, sodium chloride, that tends to have uh, always a cubic structure. So little cubes are synonymous with, uh, with sodium chloride, with salt. For quartz, which is the key crystal that I want to introduce now for these videos, it's slightly different. But nevertheless, we end up with um, faceted shapes, very well defined, faces, edges, angles. Uh, and I can illustrate this a little bit with the um, uh, quartz crystals that I've got in my mini collection of bits and pieces here. Um, I've got a photograph on the screen and we'll have a look at it perhaps under the other camera later on. But just to bring out what I was talking about in terms of faces and edges and angles, I've just gone round the edges on the photograph that I took of, of my quartz crystal to try and bring those out a little bit for you. Uh, I haven't done them all, I'm just doing this for illustrative purposes. So you can see that here we have a flat, very smooth face. There's another flat, smooth face over here, bounded by uh, these very precisely defined edges and lines and the angles between these lines are determined by the arrangement of atoms inside this quartz crystal. And the one over here is slightly different, it's been um, fractured in a slightly different way but again you can see this characteristic set of faces uh, on here in the image. Now what does this mean in terms of the arrangement of atoms? Well let's have a little peek inside. Uh, of what this means. Well quartz is a mixture of two atoms so it's really simple from that point of view. Uh, we've got atoms of silicon and in the colour scheme used in this particular ball and stick model uh, those are showing up here as this um, silvery coloured sphere and attached to each silicon atom we'll have one, two, three, four oxygen atoms. So red is oxygen in this model. And every one of them is the same. So here's another silicon action uh, atom. Here's one, two, three, four oxygen atoms attached to it. But the interesting thing to look at uh, in this model um, is that of those four oxygens, two of them and only two of them actually get shared with another silicon atom. So in other words, these little tetrahedral shapes are linked through one, two of the oxygen atoms attached to the silicon in the middle. And this is enough then to build up a three-dimensional arrangement um, 
of these uh, these basic tetrahedral shapes. Um, and we can illustrate that a little bit better with a uh, with a model that I've got. So I'm going to switch cameras now and we'll just have a look at that in some more detail. OK, so here we go. Here's our different colour scheme now. So the brown in the centre is our silicon, the white on the outside are our four oxygen atoms. And you can see that this is um, a basic tetrahedral arrangement. All right. Um, and that's what makes up our quartz crystal. These groupings of atoms uh, are what define uh, the quartz crystal here with its regular faces, the one over here that I showed in the photograph earlier. Now, how do we go from this, this basic building block, uh, into something that um, we can call a crystal uh, overall? Well, the key thing is that when we add these together, so this is an example now of two of these units being uh, tied together by a shared oxygen in the middle. The key thing for getting a crystal is that all of these arrangements have to be identical. So specifically, um, if I stand this on its end under my camera here, uh, we will have all of those angles lined up, for instance, top and bottom. All right? And that will be repeated in three dimensions. And if we have a regular arrangement like this locally, then we've got a regular arrangement of atoms across the entire quartz crystal. So if we know where these atoms are, for instance, we could calculate with quite high level of precision where all of the atoms in our quartz crystal are. And it's this arrangement that gives rise to those faceted shapes and angles and edges and so on that we saw um, highlighted in that picture I showed you earlier. Now it doesn't have to be that these tetrahedra are lined up in quite the way that I'm showing here. We could, for instance, and this is a fairly common arrangement, um, go round so that they are, if I can get it right, halfway in between, for instance. And again, provided we repeat that alignment all the way through, so they're all linked in this particular way, then again we'll have uh, a crystal of our silicon and oxygen tetrahedral. It will be a form of quartz. Okay, so we can either do this or we can do this and both of them will give us a crystalline form. So, fair enough, let's go back to the slides and take our next step uh, on this particular journey. Okay, so we've looked now at the quartz crystal and what arrangement of atoms we need uh, in order for that to be the case. Now let's move on to something that gives us a glass. And this really is a bit of imagination that was required now. So the cartoon that I've got over here uh, on the left of our slide is simply showing this chap who's lifted a cube, imaginary cube of water from the lake's surface. And that's quite useful as a tool for our imagination in the sense that it's very easy to think of the water molecules uh, rotating and tumbling and moving past each other and so on. You know, that's what allows uh, water, it's what allows any liquid uh, to flow, to move. But what if we uh, take a snapshot of the arrangement of those atoms, their positions in a moment of time? So imagine a three dimensional photograph, if you like, uh, of that material. Then we've got a solid, but it's a solid where the atoms, the molecules are not all arranged in a regular pattern. They're now disordered or amorphous. And this computer-generated model uh, 
over here on the right hand side of the screen is showing us exactly that. This was produced um, by a guy called Alistair Cormack in the United States um, and it's showing silica but in this disordered, in this amorphous form. And it's quite interesting in many ways. The colour scheme is different here, but we are just looking at silicon and oxygen atoms again. So this is just like quartz in that sense, has the same mix of silicon and oxygen atoms. But here silicon is shown in yellow and we're back to red for oxygen. And you'll notice that around a silicon atom, I'm just going to take this one as an example, we can count one, two, three, and four oxygens again, just as we had in the little tetrahedra that formed our quartz crystal. And you'll notice even beyond that, that one, two of those oxygen atoms um, are shared between two neighbouring silicon atoms, exactly as with quartz again. The difference is that now we've got, as we were showing earlier, um, this variation in angles um, in our connection between tetrahedra. Um, and this means that if we, even if we know the position of atoms in this one little unit over here, because they're just driven by uh, the chemistry of the bonding between silicon and oxygen atoms, we'd expect those to be fairly similar, whatever the form of the final uh, of the final material. But if we sit on this silicon atom, it's no longer possible to tell where the other atoms are in this material beyond a few atomic spacings at least, simply because we have lost um, that regular arrangement uh, between the two. And it really doesn't take much. Uh, to lose our crystal structure. So this is a model of a silica glass. This is a model where there is disorder, where we have an amorphous solid material left at the end of it. Locally, very similar. The rules of chemistry uh, apply in crystalline quartz just as they apply in a silica glass. The difference is only that these little units are now connected in slightly varied ways to their neighbours uh, within the material. Right, so here we are again. Here's our tetrahedra arranged in one crystalline form or another. Um, but now, what do we do to make a glass? Well, actually, it's really straightforward. All we need to do is to allow a little bit of flexing in that angle there. Right? We can do that in any direction. Um, and when I say a little bit, I'm talking about a change of less than 10 degrees, so just a few degrees in one direction or another. We can also allow a change, slight change, uh, in that angle there between our two tetrahedra. And again, we're only talking about a few degrees here, not much. But that is enough, uh, if we allow that to happen, for our ability to predict where all the atoms in our material might be, from a knowledge of where a few of them are, has gone out of the window. We now can't predict very far away, more than a few atomic distances away, uh, where our atoms are going to be. And it's just because we've allowed these small changes in angles uh, in our system. Um, so that, you know, this one up here and this little twist here, maybe, it's enough. Now that happens uh, for a lot of materials. A lot of materials have a crystal form and they will have a disordered or an amorphous form. And often that's caused by uh, taking the material from its liquid state, for instance, into a solid state, so freezing it, in other words, so fast uh, that the atoms simply haven't had time to sort themselves out, to move into their preferred crystal pattern. 
so we're left with this disordered pattern. Now glasses are, is thankfully uh, a material where that speed of cooling can be incredibly slow and still the atoms won't have time to move themselves into their crystalline uh, position. Right? It takes geological timescales to produce our quartz crystal, for instance. But we can cast glass lenses and window panes and all the rest of it uh, over extended periods of time, in fact, and still end up with the disordered arrangement, not the crystalline arrangement. So glass is a pretty useful material from that point of view. OK, so I'm going to go back to the slides now and we're going to take this, uh, we're going to step this forward just a little bit. So what are we left with now? We're left with, as I say, looking very carefully at all of these angles. So this angle of rotation of this bond, the flexing between uh, two tetrahedra and so on. So we're looking now at a statistical mix, if you like, um, of angles and therefore positions. And we end up with a study, a statistically based study of where the atoms uh, in a glass might be. And this is common to all glasses. I've just shown silica here, but it's the same for all of them. And we can find glass uh, in nature, for instance. All we need is enough heat to melt stuff and then to cool it, suitable stuff, so silicon and oxygen, for instance, uh, and to cool it to form a glass. So this is a field of obsidian. This picture was taken in one of the national parks in the United States, but it occurs all over the world. This came out of a volcano, um, solidified and formed obsidian. Anyone who's a Game of Thrones fan will know that uh, they referred to this as dragon glass, um, the referring, of course, to its thermal history exactly the same way. But this came out of uh, a volcano. So it's being produced in a way, very similar way to the way we would produce glass um, technologically. Uh, that recipe I showed you earlier required that we put uh, silica sand in a furnace with um, some soda, the remnant of seaweed in fact, so sodium, uh, and lime, so derived from chalk. Uh, we put all those in a furnace, melt them together and we have our glassy material. Well nature does exactly the same sort of thing um, to create obsidian glass. And I'll show you a little bit of that uh, close up later on. But there's even more glass in the solar system. So for instance the moon is absolutely covered in fragments of glass or fine dust particles of glass uh, as well. And that comes from the impact of meteorites. So meteorites have hit the surface of the moon, they've melted material as they've done so because they've imparted so much energy to the moon's surface. And that material, that molten material, is then sprayed up into the space over the surface. It's cooled, solidified and settled back down slowly to the surface. And what we get, there's a really good example here for instance, is we get this impact crater with striations, these really bright areas around it where this glassy material has been thrown up and landed back on the surface. There's more of it up here for instance in this region and a, and a really good example down here. Uh, and you can see going for hundreds of miles there's the evidence of this relatively recent meteorite impact uh, on the moon's surface. Relatively recent simply because quite evidently it hasn't been overwritten uh, by um, even more recent um, meteorite impacts. So it's been there for a while but it's recent because it's on the surface I suppose. Now this not only does it make the moon appear bright because it reflects so much light but you know it's also a hazard if you're an astronaut on the moon for instance because this stuff will cling to your spacesuit you'll go into an airlock you've got to be really careful to clean it off 
before you take your spacesuit off simply because alternative the alternative to that is that you brought in all these sharp edged particles that you know will get into everywhere including your lungs if you're not careful so this is going to be uh, this is going to be a bit of a hazard for living on the moon if um, if ever that's um, a thought that appeals to you as our final example we could look at these um, <coughs> excuse me thermal vents in the bottom of the ocean and again it's magma coming to the surface um, bubbling up through underwater volcanoes essentially uh, and the material that comes out molten gets solidified into glassy sorts of material but there are other ways of doing this uh, on the earth's surface and i just want to show you um, some examples of those uh, close up as it were through the other camera so let's switch over and have a look so we can have a look at this chunk of obsidian that i've got here um, as a as a first example um, this is chemically this is really really similar to quartz right so there's a couple of crystals of quartz there with their you know faceted um, faces and so on um, you know we can cleave these in the way that you can cleave all crystals so diamond for instance is a an obvious example of that um, but this is just this quartz is just silicon and oxygen in those sort of arrangements that i showed you earlier um, obsidian is also essentially silicon and oxygen but it's in a disordered and amorphous form where the tetrahedra are not in this regular three-dimensional arrangement it's black because it's contaminated with bits and pieces and in fact um, in obsidian this quite often tends to be iron so there'll be a bit of iron in here and that gives it color there's some other things as well but you know that iron will be one of the principal components but you can see that it looks like a glass um, it has the sort of fracture the conchoidal fracture shapes that you typically get with uh, broken chipped bits of glass and of course this was immensely useful for our forebears because they could produce some really sharp edges using obsidian it was a highly valued material you can produce some great arrowheads um, from uh, from obsidian and materials like it but it's not the only way that nature produces a glass on the surface of the earth <coughs> excuse me so we can go for instance to meteorite strikes exactly as we looked at on the moon and we get from that these uh, these tectites uh, formed um, and these are essentially surface material that's been melted by meteorite impact flung upwards uh, it'll land on the earth's surface cooled um, this one comes from Arizona from the desert so it's sand it's um, just silicon and oxygen atoms melted cooled into a glass it looks um, black on the outside simply because it's got a bit of surface contamination this has been kicking around in the desert for centuries if not thousands of years um, since that meteorite impact uh, and it's um, it's taken on a bit of surface coloring but if I use my laser pointer here um, you'll be able to see fairly readily I hope um, that a lot of the light travels straight through it um, so inside this dark apparently dark globule uh, is actually quite a clear quite a high quality um, silica gas just made by melting sand now that requires really high temperatures uh, it requires temperatures in excess of 1500 1600 degrees centigrade but nevertheless there are processes in nature like volcanic eruptions like meteorite impacts that can produce that i've got another um, example that i think is even more impressive uh, this is something called um, libyan um, desert glass and it's actually from Libya believe it or not from the desert uh, this comes from a meteorite impact uh, which melted a lot of the sand in the desert this was a huge impact 
threw it up into the air and then bits of glass come back down again uh, and settle on the surface so there are there are um, thousands of tons of this stuff scattered over very large areas uh, of the desert um, you can see it's slightly yellow in, in, in colour um, there were some contaminants in there obviously but again if I you know if I put my laser pointer on the far face you can see that its transparency is actually really high uh, this is a good quality um, piece of glass that's been made naturally uh, by uh, just melting sand um, so there we are glass made of relatively pure silica uh, by meteorite strike but again not the only process whereby we can uh, we can create those high temperatures lightning strikes into sand particularly on beaches where the sand is going to be a little bit conductive because of the salt water that, that's been in it so lightning strikes the sand it vaporizes the water which forms little channels in the sand it pushes uh, things outward because you had this explosive vaporization of the uh, of the water uh, the dampness in the sand but around the edge we'll get sand melted into these structures these fulgurites um, it's a bit rough and ready very rough surface uh, to this for instance um, but that is albeit rough that is a tube made in a beach after lightning struck the sand uh, and melted uh, melted the sand and produced this glass tube now these can be several meters long I mean it's obviously extremely difficult to get out of the ground in one piece you tend to get smaller pieces like this uh, available um, but this fulgurite is another example of how nature has produced glass uh, by generating some very high temperatures and melting sand but nature's even more cunning than that nature actually came up long ago with a way of making glass at low temperatures and that's what i want to show you uh, examples of now so i'm going to flick back to the slides And just show you these little critters um, so over here on the left we have a nautilus sea snail uh, and this humble creature has built for itself not only a geometrically intricate uh, but chemically amazing shell this shell uh, is a silicate glass that it's grown at the temperature of the seawater so no furnace is involved no melting involved it's grown it by chemical processes and we can go down to the microscopic uh, these scale bars here will show you uh, that these genuinely are microscopic creatures this is 10 uh, microns so millionths of a meter um, these are tiny 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 but these diatoms have created for themselves skeletons that are um, essentially a glass grown chemically uh, from silicon and oxygen in the seawater of which there is a lot but an even more impressive example i think is this one so this is a, a venus flower basket um, and uh, it what we're seeing here is the skeleton of a deep sea sponge um, and this skeleton is glass it's in fact a very high quality um, almost pure silica glass so just silicon and oxygen uh, and it's it's amazingly intricate this sponge has built this skeleton for itself out of the silicon and oxygen that it's taken uh, from the sea seawater around it so if we have a look at some expanded sections here and you can see just how fine this work is we have a structure of fine glass filaments here glass fibers being grown in nature long before we had glass fibers in in our technological world um, and creating this wonderful wonderful skeletal structure 
but let me switch cameras again one more time just to show you what this thing looks like close up so here we have it uh, in real life as it were um, this is a Venus flower basket and you can see that it's enclosed completely enclosed volume uh, we have this sort of tassel at the end these are glass fibers also you can see they're really quite fine under there now you'll have to take my word for it at the moment that this is indeed a glass but I'll show you some experimental evidence for this um, as we go through this video series so remember this because we will we will be coming back to it but this is a Venus flower basket uh, in reality as it were so the skeleton of a deep sea sponge um, made chemically by the sponge um, out of silicon and, and oxygen now why Venus flower basket well because uh, a pair of shrimp will spend their lives basically together trapped inside the skeleton um, feeding from um, the food that the uh, the sponge takes out of the uh, surrounding seawater um, and in the process cleaning up the inside of the sponge for it so it's a good relationship but this skeleton uh, is way too fine for the shrimp to escape so they are literally trapped in there for their lifetimes um, so the Victorians rather loved this idea um, this is lifelong fidelity after all so hence the uh, hence the name Venus um, flower basket these in Victorian times these would have changed hands for the equivalent now of you know several hundred pounds 500 pounds plus rather nice rather beautiful thing I think um, the young of the shrimp I probably should add are small enough to escape so you know once the shrimp have, have um, had young those young will escape they'll go and find their own sponges and partners to set up home with as it were uh, and the cycle will all uh, will complete all over again so there we are a very elaborate form of glass grown um, at low temperatures in nature so let's go back to our slides again so here's our basic recipe um, I've sort of mentioned this in passing before this is a furnace based technology this is um, this is how it would have all started as it were so there's an old recipe up here uh, it is sand silicon and oxygen uh, that's all sand is it's just grains of silica um, and these uh, these forms of glass will have been dominated by that as most forms of glass are and to that we put in some powdered dried seaweed essentially uh, and a little bit of um, heat treated chalk and that produced for you then a glass that you could pour and shape and do whatever you wanted to and if I recast this original sort of recipe into uh, a more modern form so these percentages are still percentages by weight so three quarters of our glass by this recipe would have been sand so that's just silica silicon and oxygen we have a little bit a seventh roughly that is soda so sodium carbonate that's what we got from our seaweed essentially and then 10% will be lime so that's our heat treated chalk calcium carbonate um, to give it its proper chemical form so the important bits then are silicon and oxygen um, and this element sodium carbonate matters rather little as we'll see later on and calcium and those components are the key components for making glass and that recipe or variants of it have been around for a long time so 5,000 years ish and nobody knows where 
this was first developed. There's lots of myths and stories associated with it. Phoenician traders lighting fire on a beach somewhere and noticing they got glass left afterwards and so on. These are just stories. They're, they're you know, nice illustrative stories, but they don't actually um, convey truth in any wider sense of the word. But it's been around for this very long time, nevertheless, wherever it came about. Uh, and it was really valuable. Um, it was a material, after all, that you could produce in quantity that had a lot of the characteristics of a gem. So it was shiny, it scattered the light nicely, uh, you could produce shapes with it, all sorts of stuff. So actually it was really valuable. Uh, and when people started putting um, uh, recipes together, so producing manuals for making glass, for instance, um, you know, which certainly happened within the last 3,000 years, then uh, these were fairly closely guarded because this stuff, um, this stuff, as I say, was valuable. It was worth a lot in trade. So when King Ashurbanipal um, commissioned this manual, um, you know, way back in uh, 7th century BC, uh, it would have been a technological tool that was really quite a, a valuable thing for a, a king to uh, to possess. Um, and then we sort of move forward a bit and we get to glass blowing. So now we're producing glass vessels, for instance, and that arose in, in Syria, probably about 2000 years ago uh, or thereabouts. Um, and the Romans brought that technology with them when they came to Britain. Uh, now, interestingly, we didn't actually make glass in Britain even after the Romans arrived uh, very much. That was developed a little bit later on. The Romans had this habit of making glass um, and breaking it down into chunks and shipping it to the edges of their empire, as Britain was, and then remelting it and forming it into whatever they wanted. Um, you know, that way. So although we certainly have all the raw materials for making glass in the UK, uh, and indeed there are a lot of sites around the UK that show a lot of archaeological evidence for, for glass manufacture. So although the Romans did a lot with glass, including using it uh, architecturally for the first time, um, in Britain it took us a while to go on from that and actually produce glass from raw ingredients ourselves. Uh, and in fact, you can find glass associated with most furnace sites uh, here and elsewhere around the world, in fact. And there's a, there's a chunk of um, furnace slag shown in this picture up here, which um, uh, is a sample held um, in the Beanie Institute in Canterbury, the Canterbury Museums and Galleries, um, because it was very common to have a pan or a bed of sand underneath the furnace in order to catch spills and so on. And also, of course, um, sand was used in order to hold a mould in place, for instance, while, um, while liquid metals and so on were poured into it. So spillages very often were um, creating glassy materials as that's you know the molten material hit the glass and if the conditions was right uh, were right you could get a glassy material formed. Um, I won't change cameras to show you this uh, but this is a piece of furnace slag for instance from an industrial an old industrial site in um, Scandinavia somewhere. Uh, it looks from its colour as though it may have had some iron or perhaps copper um, in the sand, but this is a waste product from industrial processes because there happened to be some sand uh, nearby that got heated up with whatever came out of the furnace and produced this um, uh, this sort of lump of, of waste glass. Um, and this is a bit of a tangent, but um, if you remember to back to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. There was a bed of sand underneath the reactor 
um, in that power plant and when the core melted and it came through uh, the bottom of its containment vessel it actually landed in this bed of sand. So that was really useful in the sense that the sand was melted and it formed a glass, it formed a radioactive glass with all this material that had landed in it but nevertheless it created a glass which solidified and therefore didn't leak out into the environment so um, the loss of radioactive material into the local environment uh, would have been even more serious had it not been for the fact that you know a great fraction of it had created a much more stable solidified glass um, as it ran into this bed of sand uh, in the bottom of the re reactor building. As I say that was an aside. Let's skip on in our historical um, tour to the Middle Ages. Uh, um, in the Middle Ages we start seeing people purposefully colouring glass. Um, and we're going to come back to that in a little bit more detail further on in this video series. But of course that enabled stained glass windows uh, to become a big sort of artistic um, expression um, beginning back in, in those Middle Ages. And we also saw at the same time the production of crystal glass, lead glass, uh, it will perhaps come to be known. Um, centred around Venice initially, so Venetian glass, Cristallo glass, uh, very very highly prized at the time, but the secret leaked out eventually and we started getting versions of it produced um, you know all over the place as it were. But that was a fairly big step forward in the technology of glass, in the control of glass properties by controlling you know what you added to it and so on. But if we step forward another um, few centuries we get to what is perhaps the UK's uh, biggest single contribution to glass technology uh, and this came out of the work that Alistair Pilkington did in the uh, in fact in the decade of my birth um, developing the float glass process so all our window panes all the shop fronts for instance um, in our high streets all of that was is produced now from this float glass process and I'll tell you more about that later on uh, but it is perhaps the um, the UK's big claim to fame when it comes to um, uh, this product that is now so ubiquitous around the world in terms of smooth large area flat panes of glass but of course you know glass is ubiquitous in other ways as well uh, you know, think of all the glass bottles and, and computer screens, for instance, and lenses in webcams and cameras and smartphones and so on. All of that relies on high levels of glass processing technology. But we need to dive a little bit into the science again uh, before we move on, I think, to technology. And I want to show you in another form now what constitutes a glass in terms of its chemical makeup. Uh, we've established that a principal ingredient is going to be sand, it's silicon and oxygen, okay, and our classic glass form is this soda lime glass that we see uh, in this row of our table here. So you know all of our bottles for instance are soda lime glasses. Um, and approximately three quarters by weight uh, of a glass like that will be sand. But you remember we added to it um, soda, so from seaweed basically, uh, and the pr principal component there is sodium. There's oxygen again, but sodium is the metal. So about 15% um, of our soda lime glass will be soda. And we also had lime, remember, calcium oxide chemically, uh, and there's five or ten percent of that. And the rest, other bits and pieces. So if we want to colour the glass, for instance, we'll put something in to make it brown or green or, you know, whatever the colour is that we're choosing. And we'll come back to colouring glass later on. But this is the basic formulation. So here's sand, 
um, seaweed chalk right or derived from those things and that is the classic formula that I showed you on that earlier slide the old recipe of how you make a glass and this is simply stating it in um, a chemical form now we can make a glass without necessarily using silicon there are other elements in the periodic table that will make a three-dimensional network for us as well a glass network uh, boron is one of those so boron oxide can be used to form a network um, it doesn't have these tetrahedral shapes which then link through an oxygen atom actually boron oxide forms rings of atoms and actually it's those rings that then join together on their edges to produce our glass structure um, aluminium oxide alumina uh, can form a glass network network as well as can phosphorus so we have silicate glasses borate aluminate and phosphate glasses and all of them have their own characteristics uh, all of them are important in their own right uh, but these four together we would refer to as the network formers. Uh, these are the elements that can create for us this stable three-dimensional uh, disordered or amorphous solid material. And then into that we add things. So we add sodium, uh, soda in our original recipe, uh, and we can add other elements like calcium. Uh, and these are called network formers, uh, sorry, network modifiers, uh, because these quite literally do modify uh, our original network. And it's worth just dwelling on this aspect just a little bit at this point. It's an important piece of, of technology. So making a glass out of sand is difficult because remember we need those exceptionally high temperatures to do it 1500 degrees centigrade or so and that was way beyond the uh, capabilities of, of early early furnaces and ovens in fact it's only quite recently we could have attained that sort of temperature uh, and so this is where the soda comes in this is where sodium comes in this has a dramatic effect on lowering the melting temperature. So instead of 1500 degrees, we now only need a few hundred degrees, so five, 600 degrees centigrade. Um, and that makes glass forming then accessible for the um, older furnaces, particularly those that, you know, where bellows were involved to get the temperature up a little bit. So in order to make the thing practicable in the first place as a material to make, we absolutely needed to add something like sodium to lower that melting temperature. But now if you want to blow glass, if you want to form it into determined shapes, you actually need to be able to have um, a range where it's workable, a range of temperatures. And calcium is um, really useful in that respect. So we put lime in that original recipe um, because it increases the range of that workable temperature where the glass is soft enough that you can blow a shape, but not so soft that it flops and flows away. It will hold that shape um, if you do your glass blowing and so on properly. So sodium and calcium have these enormously important technological uses in terms of producing the earliest forms of glass and a form of glass that we still have in use today. But if we step forward to the Venetian glass, the Cristallo glass, um, that lowers the amount, the proportion I should say, of silicon uh, oxide in there, silica, by adding really huge amounts of lead or lead oxide uh, into the mix and that's what gave the, uh, the glass its clarity, it's what gave it its density, it's what gave it its brightness uh, in light um, and it's actually what causes a, um, uh, 
a lead glass, you know, a wine glass to um, ring when you ping the edge of it. It's all because we've added this lead into the middle. And you'll notice here that you can, uh, you know, we still need something to lower the melting temperature of our initial silica, but it doesn't have to be sodium. Um, potassium, its neighbour in the periodic table, um, can do the same job. So in fact you could use either uh, in these glasses and still um, produce something with a melting temperature that's, you know, reasonable, accessible. If we skip forward, so we're, we're sort of within the last two centuries now, uh, we get something that's technically referred to as a borosilicate glass uh, because we've added boron into our silicon network former. In fact, there's a little bit of aluminium in there as well. Um, but these are the two principal network formers. And this is important because by making this sort of admixture, we've created a glass now that doesn't expand or shrink um, when we heat it or cool it. So this is why you can take your Pyrex uh, kitchenware out of the oven and it doesn't shatter uh, if a part of it then touches cold water. It's because that part is not shrinking, it's not contracting as it gets colder, uh, it's staying the same uh, size and shape. So there are no stresses and strains in our Pyrex um, oven where it doesn't pull itself apart. If you've ever looked up at um, high tension power cables in the power grid across the country, for instance, you might have noticed glass insulators, sort of donut shaped pieces of glass up there. Those would tend to be aluminosilicates, so they will be used in that sort of environment. And these are really uh, high melting temperature glasses, so you'll notice no sodium or potassium in those at all. Um, and um, there'll be a lot of aluminium in there with uh, the silicon as the network formers, and that produces something that, that is stable up to really, really high temperatures and still electrically insulating, which, you know, most glasses are. And we get to the really sort of um, uh, wacky stuff down here when we talk about bioactive glasses. Uh, these are glasses that actually elicit a biological response if they're inside a body. Now I've left um, all of the numbers associated with that inscrutable at this stage. We will come back to it uh, in the final video in this series. Um, it's an absolutely fancy, uh, fascinating aspect of glass science in its own right, uh, but I'm going to leave it blank for now, purposefully. So we've got to the end of our first video. Uh, this is my um, timely piece of glass sculpture um, shown here to end the um, to end the session. It seemed appropriate for. Uh, 2020, if not a pleasant sight to see, but it's an intricate and rather um, impressive piece of glass sculpture nonetheless. So come back and join me for video two and we'll take this um, aspect of glass science a little bit further. We'll push a little bit deeper uh, inside what makes a glass what it is and why it has the properties that it does. I'll see you then. Bye for now.